Of the nine characteristics of a blue zone, a region where people tend to live longer, better, there is one characteristic that comes with a caveat, wine at five. People in all but one of the blue zones drink alcohol moderately and regularly. Moderate drinkers outlive non-drinkers. The trick is to drink one to two glasses per day with friends and with food. Actually, this characteristic comes with a couple of caveats. The first is that it's not a universal rule. Loma Linda, California is one of the world's five blue zones because it's home to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Seventh-day Adventists are fastidious about diet. They don't drink wine or any alcohol. They also avoid caffeine and most meat. And they tend to be quite healthy and live longer, better. So maybe it's not the glass of wine at five that works wonders. And here's another caveat. While some people can drink one glass of wine at five, others drink one after another. For them, alcohol is an addiction, and no addiction is healthy. That's why this characteristic comes with a caveat. The ancient Greeks followed a simple philosophy, everything in moderation and nothing to excess. When it comes to wine at five, the benefit probably comes less from the wine itself and more from the family, friends, and food. Eating alone is no fun, and drinking alone is probably problematic. But gathering with family, friends, and food can be very healthy. Now, there is one place where you can gather with family and friends for wine at five that I can recommend without reservation. We have wine at five every Saturday at Lord of Life and Sunday morning as well. We gather as a family at the table, in, with, and under the wine and bread. We remember Jesus' death and we receive his forgiveness. And that's life enriching. Here's what Martin Luther said in the small catechism. What's the benefit of such eating and drinking? The words given for you and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin Show us that forgiveness of sin, life, and salvation are given to us in the sacrament through these words, because where there is forgiveness of sin, there is also life and salvation. Now, we use alcohol-free wine at Lord of Life so that every person can commune without reservation. I guess that makes worship the biggest blue zone of all. We all want to live longer, better, and like Luther said, where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Welcome to worship, welcome to Lord of Life, where we gather at the table to be happy, healthy, and whole. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at one hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everyone? 
Jesus said, who then is the faithful and prudent manager whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly, I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all his possessions. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. The gospel readings keep getting more difficult. Over the past month, we've heard about the Good Samaritan, a feel-good story about a person who does the right thing, even at great cost to himself. Then the story of Mary and Martha and finding that balance between work and worship. Then we had that little parable about the neighbor who knocks on the door at night. A reminder that God always knows our needs and more importantly, always opens the door. And then the story about the bigger barns and the reminder that you can't take it with you. And the key question each each week is not what must I do? No, the question is, how should I live? Knowing that I live by the grace of God, knowing that all I have is a gift from God, knowing that I can't keep it no matter how big a barn I build, how then should I live? In today's gospel, Jesus says simply, sell what you have and be rich toward heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. That's not easy at all. It's difficult. In fact, I'll take it one step further. It's almost impossible. Unless you're prepared to take a vow of poverty and live off the kindness of strangers. But if everyone did that, if everyone took these words literally and sold the farm, well, there wouldn't be anyone to buy it. And it's no wonder that Peter asks, Is this parable for us, meaning the 12 disciples, or for everyone? It's one thing to ask saints to act like, well, saints. But does God really expect everyone to live like saints till kingdom come? And what about that kingdom? Peter and the disciples believed that God's kingdom would come before they died. That Jesus would return any day. The Apostle Paul believed the same thing. And when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, Christians were convinced that the world was ending then and there. And here we are, 2,000 years later, still waiting. When General Douglas MacArthur left the Philippines in 1942, he said, I shall return, and two years later he did. And even though it's just a movie, Star Wars fans all know about the return of the Jedi. But what about the return of Jesus? It's been a long time since he left us in charge of the store. How long are we expected to watch and wait? And how are we to live in the meantime? A Sunday school teacher asked her class, If I sold my house and my car and had a big garage sale and gave all the money to the church, would I get into heaven? No, the children all answered. If I cleaned the church every day, swept the leaves, and kept everything neat and tidy, would I get into heaven? Again, the answer was no. Well, she continued, then how can I get into heaven? A little boy shouted out, the first thing you have to do is die. The last thing we want to do is die. The first thing we want to do is live and know how to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. And what is the kingdom of God? Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. What does it mean to pray for God's kingdom to come? Some people think that that means we're praying for an end to this world. Others believe that we're supposed to turn this world into God's kingdom. The term for that is theocracy. When radical Muslims seized power in Iran, 
and established a theocracy run by religious law, we realized that wasn't a good thing. So why would we think it's a good thing that Christian nationalism is on the rise in this country? It's just another form of theocracy. This week, our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, joined with other Christian leaders in rejecting Christian nationalism. What is Christian nationalism? It seeks to merge Christian and American identities, distorting both the Christian faith and America's constitutional democracy. Christian nationalism demands Christianity be privileged by the state and implies that to be a good American, one must be Christian. And it's not just a few prominent church leaders who signed this statement. Thousands of pastors and priests have added their names, as did I. If you'd like to learn more about Christian nationalism, I encourage you to read the statement at christiansagainstchristiannationalism.org. And copies of the statement are available in the church narthex. So what does it mean when we pray God's kingdom come? Here's what Martin Luther says in the small catechism. The second petition, your kingdom come. What does this mean? In fact, God's kingdom comes on its own without our prayer. But we ask in this prayer that it may also come to us. And then Luther goes on to say, well, how does that happen? Through the Holy Spirit's grace, we believe God's word and live godly lives here in time and hereafter in eternity. In other words, God's kingdom isn't something that we're going to build and God's will isn't something that we are going to impose. What we pray for in the Lord's Prayer is that God's will will be done in our lives that we will love God and neighbor, that we will take time for work and worship, that instead of building bigger barns to keep our stuff, we grow bigger hearts to share the gifts God's given us. Let me say two more things about how we are to live. The first is that when Jesus says, watch and wait, waiting and watching is always the opposite of sleeping. Remember the scene in the garden when Jesus went to pray on the night he was betrayed? And he told his disciples to watch and wait, and he came back and found them asleep. Jesus says, stay alert, keep your lamps lit, be ready and waiting. And the second thing is this. Today's gospel is good news. Don't be afraid, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And then Jesus says, Blessed are those servants whom the Master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come serve them. You know, that reminds me of the Last Supper. When Jesus, who was the host, washed the feet of his disciples and then serve them dinner. What a great way to imagine what that supper will be like when the kingdom comes at last and God, who is host, prepares a table and our cup runs over and we will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.